Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for Trinity University's Latinx Heritage Month event this Thursday. We're really excited. Um, sorry, it's warmer out there than it was last week. <laughs> um, tonight, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Sonia M. Aleman. She's an associate professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio in the Mexican American Studies uh, in the, uh, sorry, program in race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality studies. She's also the department director of the Women's Study Institute. She studies intersections of race, racism, and whiteness in the media. She's also invested in improving the educational experiences of students of color. Originally from South Texas, Dr. Aleman taught at the University of Utah for five years prior to relocating back home. We're so glad you're back. And and she currently serves as the lead editor of the Chicana and Latina Studies, the Journal of Mujeres Activas en Letras y Cambio Social. Again, if you would please help me welcome Dr. Aleman. Thank you so much for that, Courtney. And um, thank you to the Student Diversity and Inclusion Office for the um, invitation to address the Trinity community this evening as part of your kicking off your um, Latinx Heritage Month. As someone who spent her undergraduate years here in San Antonio, um, relishing in the Tejano music scene that Selena Quintanilla catapulted to its peak, I am truly awed and humbled to be back in the city teaching about Selena, talking about Selena, learning from Selena. In fact, it is that experience that has given shape to the remarks I'm gonna to share tonight. Uh, I will share with you, bitty bitty bomb bomb, what studying Selena reveals about us. And for tonight, the us which I am referring to includes Tejanos, Mexican Americans, and Chicanas, Chicanos, and Chicanequis from South Texas, communities that I identify with that make up 64% of San Antonio's population, 21% of Trinity's student population, a number the institution I believe intends to grow, and 84% um, of the population of South Texas, an area Selena Quintanilla called home. And given the context of tonight's event, I thought this was a, a fitting focal point. So to best uh, utilize our time together, I've organized my talk into three sections. Um, to help you get to know a little bit more about me, I will share the lived experiences and memories that I have of Selena that inform the ways that I teach about her. And because I have the immense pleasure of teaching the first class in Texas anchored on the life and legacy of Selena Quintanilla, which is Courtney um, uh, mentioned, I believe, led to my invitation this evening, I thought I would briefly provide background about how the course evolved and came to be offered at UTSA. But the bulk of my talk will be to address the question posed in the title, what can we learn about Tejanos, Mexican Americans, Chicanos, um, and by studying Selena? In essence, I am distilling a portion of my 16-week syllabus into um, examples of the themes and points of analysis I engage in with my students. Specifically, I will share excerpts from the reading material in the class that discuss Selena's body and point to the way it allows students to think about how Latina bodies are read and understood. I will then share quotes that reference the borderlands, the area that Selena toured for the majority of her career, and explain how students and I deconstruct the discourses about the border that are revealed in this writing. And finally, uh, the last set of passages will look at the way Selena is described as being bicultural and bilingual. And I'll um, close out by talking about how my students, uh, many who were not alive when Selena was performing and singing, unpack these quotes in my class. And then I hope um, that I can keep that to about 35 minutes so that I leave plenty of opportunities for questions from you all. And I'm a little, a little rusty, so forgive me if this feels a little uh, choppy or slow, but it's been a while since I've um, done this live. Um, but I'll start here. So I have several Selena stories. They are the reasons why I dreamed of, designed, and now teach the course. As a Chicana born and raised in South Texas, Selena's music, music featured prominently in the mixtape of my teenage and college years. 
I have memories of seeing her perform a handful of times between 1991 and 1995, along with many of the great Tejano artists at the time. But the Selena story I wanted to tell now is about the last time I saw Selena perform. It was in January of 1995 at a club called Tejano Rodeo, which was one of San Antonio's many Tejano nightclubs that were spread throughout the city in the 90s. So alongside my boyfriend at the time, now husband, Dr. Enrique Aleman Jr., who some of you might have the chance to take a class from here at Trinity. Well, two and a half decades ago, he and I stood uh, in front of the stage for an up close and personal view of Selena's performance when we ourselves were not on the dance floor dancing to her music. And when I say up close and personal, I mean it. The stage was um, just a, a few feet off the ground than this stage is, but we were standing like right here in front of her performing, if you can imagine that on the stage. And in those days, the main act would play a set, take a brief intermission, and then come back for a second act. And so on this night, after intermission, Selena came out in a new outfit than what she opened the night with. It was a white halter jumpsuit cut very similar to her iconic purple jumpsuit. It was just all in white and sparkling. Um, I, I remember it either had glitter or some sort of like beading on it, but that stood out to me. And she opened her second act singing First I was afraid, I was petrified as she strode across the stage. And I remember being caught off guard that night, thinking, um, why, why is she singing this disco music? And why did she change? And, and why did she sing it in English? And I looked around at um, everybody, all the patrons that were there with me, and they were in their typical Tejano dancing attire, cowboy hats, cowboy boots, starched Western shirts, um, big belt buckles, wranglers, and I thought, are they gonna like this music? Um, we're all here to dance to Tejano music. Well, within seconds, they were all singing, swaying, dancing along with her. It was clear they loved her singing this. But I was so struck by the shift in what Selena performed that I remember talking about the assortment of disco songs that she sang after the show with um, Enrique and my future brother-in-law deliber deliberating if Selena was, was going to start re releasing music in English and wondering how we would fel feel if she did that. So that night, without realizing it, I was asking questions about what it meant to live in two different cultural spaces, and Selena was the reason why. Two months later, she was shot and killed by Yolanda Saldivar, a day in tragedy we, Tejanos, Mexican-Americans, Chicanas Os Equis, and other Latinas Os Equis still grieve from. And when I saw the video footage of our concert at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo from February 26th, sometime later, I realized how priceless this mess, last memory of her was. I had actually watched Selena sing the disco, excuse me, <clears throat> sing the disco medley before she immortalized it with her infamous opening at the Astrodome concert. <clears throat> I, did, I distinctly remember how I spent the day um, that she was killed and how I found out, but it's not a day that I can easily talk about. Um, but another day that still causes me to get a little choked up is the first time I saw the trailer for the biopic of her life. I was living in New York City at the time, shortly after graduating and getting married, and I was in a movie theater waiting for the film Evita, a 1996 musical drama about Eva Peron that starred Madonna in the lead role. This whitewashed casting was the closest I could get to a representation of a Latina in a Hollywood film at the time. And so as the trailers played, a black screen plunged the entire theater into darkness, and I heard Selena's voice belt out, first I was afraid, then I was petrified. And then the light shifted across the screen and a figure with her back to the camera came into view walking across the stage where the lights were slowly going up, and it was Jennifer Lopez as Selena. Now please remember, this was a time before internet, before cell phones, before social media, playing, providing instantaneous news and entertainment information. So I was somewhat aware that a film was being made about her, but I was still taken by surprise by this brief te teaser. I was astounded to recognize a part of myself on the movie screen in front of me. A place in a place that was so unlike home, and I, an onslaught of tears started running down my face. 
It was years later before I could fully articulate the source of those emotions as a convergence of joy, validation, and anger at how infrequently I saw myself in mainstream media fare. The trailer for Selena's biopic pointed to my thirst for representation. And so after I pursued a master's degree and a PhD in media and communication years later, I recognized the enduring demand for Selena's image, her aesthetic, and her voice as a way to counteract how rarely me and other Tejanas Chicanas Latinas see our phenotype, our body shape, or our mestizo visage. How infrequently we hear Pocho Spanish or Spanglish in the mainstream public discourse. How seldom Mexican origin people are central, celebrated, and contextualized in either news or entertainment. This indeed was a powerfully moving experience that significantly impacted my scholarly interest in mediated representations of Latina or X communities. And it took time, including eight years of graduate school and 11 years away from Texas, raising my children on her music and her movie. And here you can see a glimpse of my two daughters dressed as Selena for Halloween one year. To fuse my embodied experience as a Selena fan, my expertise as a researcher, and my pedagogical approaches as an educator to distill a recognition and appreciation of Selena's legacy into a course for UTSA students. The idea for the course came about during my first semester teaching an introductory Mexican American studies course about various forms of Latino cultural expressions that are wrought out of a history of disenfranchisement, racialization, biculturalism, and bilingualism recognizing Selena's continued presence in San Antonio and South Texas, where the majority of UTSA students hail from. I engaged Selena's legacy as a culture producer in one of these introductory courses. I quickly realized that um, while my students were quite familiar with her image and her music, I was the only person in a classroom of about 50 predominantly Latina OX undergraduates that had been alive at the time Selena was. And I realized I had a very different relationship with an, an understanding of Selena as a result of the fact that we were born within the same generation and that this was an opportunity to design a course built around Selena's legacy for our Mexican American Studies program. And luckily, my colegas at UTSA agreed as faculty members at a Hispanic serving institution with a student body that is 55% Latina OX that is situated in the Tejano music capital, it made sense for us to offer a class about Selena what she accomplished in a male-dominated industry, what she represents to the broader Tejana OX, Chicana OX, and Latina OX communities, and what she signifies to her legions of national and international fans is deserving of a semester-long treatment. I volunteered to write the course description for the class, which is what you see here, and the curriculum approval process was underway. And about three or four semesters later, the Mexican American program that I was in transitioned into a department, and the Selena course had successfully made its way through the various layers of approval and was ready to become part of our course offerings. I knew this course had the potential to be a signature course for our new department, acting as a gateway for students pursuing a Mexican American studies major, but more importantly, it would help validate the lived experiences of Mexican American communities as worthy of study. And that is what the next portion of my talk will map out. One of the first decisions that I had to make when designing the course was determining the material students will read, watch, or listen to. If you've ever typed Selena into Google, you will know that you will end up with an an infinite repository of material, hours and hours and hours of reading material, fan memories, messages to her, biographies, as well as footage from interviews, performances, commercials, award shows, etc. So I had the task of narrowing that down for a 16-week semester. And what I decided to do was to focus on the scholarship that is published academic work either peer-reviewed journal articles about her or books by academics about Selena, rather than mainstream news accounts of her career or her tragic death and no unauthorized biographies about her. So about 95% of the course material is drawn from this type of work. 
This focus allowed me to create a curriculum that demonstrates an intellectual approach to understanding Selena and her fandom. And as most, most of these pieces seek to answer some form of the question, why does Selena continue to be so meaningful? How is she meaningful to her fans? An important note about the only book that we use in the class, the book is titled Selinidad, Selena, Latinos and the Performance of Memory, and it is written by one of the preeminent Sol Selena scholars, Dr. Deborah Paredes, who's a San Antonio native and who is an alum of Trinity University. She graduated with her BA in English from here. She writes about how Selena is remembered, a range of practices that she terms Selinidad. If you tune into media, media, media tributes, to Selena that occur around the anniversary of her death or other kinds of celebrations of her accomplishments, you might hear your fellow Trinity Tiger, Dr. Paredes, discussing how she understands Selena's impact and significance. With these parameters framing the set of reading material that I chose for the course, I began to notice a few patterns about this body of work. For one, a significant amount of the scholarly work about Selena was written and published within the first decade after her death. This meant that the fans implicated in these articles were primarily those who were alive during the breadth of Selena's career. Again, I, I saw this, uh, I continued to see this as an opportunity to contribute to the knowledge produced about Selena regarding this set of fans who have grown to know and love her since her death. It actually inspired the primary course assignments for the course, so my students interview what we call second generation Selena fans, asking them to articulate what Selena means to them, and then I have them work in a group to put together a final presentation ref reflecting on their analysis of the commonalities and differences that they find um, in the sense making their interviewees offered. In essence, they become Selena scholars themselves Other patterns in how Selena is described, explained, or theorized in the course readings are highlighted in this last part of my talk today. The themes prevalent in this body of work about why Selena continues to generate such a vibrant and dynamic fan base are listed on the slide. So what I specifically want to focus on, however, is that, is that which of these factors, whether it's the role of the Selena movie, the genealogy, the ethno kind of music genealogy of her music, her beauty, her booty, her outfits, her commodification, or the cultural practices of her marginalized fan base, they all reflect some assumptions and understandings about the communities who make up her fandom that I unpack with my students. And I usually start by helping them to see that it matters who is writing about Selena. Specifically, is it someone who knew of her before the public spectacle of her death? Or is it someone who didn't? It matters if they are writing to explain Selena to white, dominant, or mainstream communities who didn't know her, or engaging with Mexican-American, Tejano, Chicana, o X, or Latina, o X communities. I think this will become evident when you see the examples of these works that I'll share on the next couple of slides. So after all this buildup, I think I'm supposed to switch slides now. Um, I'm going to offer one last bit of framing before I move into this last set of slides. I've selected six quotes that I think are representative of three of the topics or themes that sc scholars have pointed to that explain Selena's impact. These topics, again, are bodies, primarily the bodies of Mexican-American women, the border as a geographic space that Selena hails from and built her fan base in, and bicultural bilingual, referring to the characteristics of living as a Mexican-American in the US that many, many scholars point to as central to understanding Selena's significance. I've identified two quotes per topic. Each quote is on its own slide. I will show them one at a time, walking through the ways that I work with my students to ask questions about them, to interrogate them, and how we might compare them. So here we go. So here is a quote from one of the pieces we read early on in the semester. The author wrote, with her simple clothes and cinnamon skin, Selena looked exactly like the people. She showed us just how beautiful we could be, and she did it without dyeing her hair Fanta orange or wearing those oppressive blue contacts that make so many of us look like fallen angels. She was this gorgeous chola morena who never forgot her pueblo, and we feel under her protection. 
So I've highlighted a few pieces of that quote. The author describes what she's wearing, and she only uses the word simple. And so it's unique in this particular piece because a lot of people, both scholars and the general public, often note the unique attributes of Selena's clothing, right? <clears throat> they were trendsetting for the Tejano genre, music genre at the time. Many were original. Many were hand-sewn pieces that Selena herself designed or crafted. They were revealing for the time period, and for the current generation, they are considered iconic. So I asked my students, what do you think she means by referring to them as simple here? She describes her skin tone, which she refers to as cinnamon, a rich, earthy, coppery hue, choosing a term that denotes warmth and sweetness and something homemade. And I would ask my students to consider what are the ways they have heard darker toned skin described? What words are often used? What is it like to have this term describe her? For me, in this context, it feels very loving and accepting, normalizing this phenotype. I would also have them note that she calls Selena beautiful and gorgeous without changing anything about herself. I color and hair color stay the same. So it's not unusual for Selena to be called beautiful. It's very common. But the fact that she normalizes her aesthetic as equally worthy of being called beautiful as dominant Eurocentric beauty norms is certainly a deliberate move on the part of the author. Um, lastly, I think it's fun to help students think through why she calls her a chola, because I think Selena's father especially would cringe to hear her described that way. Um, and I would ask students to think, how do you understand what she means? You know, what kind of negative connotations do we have attached to that word that the author might be challenging, reclaiming, or asserting? Does Selena fit your expectations of a chola? If not, why do we have negative expectations of a chola? What would it mean to re-envision all cholas as Selena? And so um, we, this is, these are mere kind of jumping off points for um, our conversations in class. We aren't doing a line-by-line -line analysis, but this gives you kind of an example of what some of the pieces you know, allow, um, point to the kind of conversations we might have. So try to hold kind of all these questions in your head about this particular quote as I move to the next one. So in this quote, the author is trying to provide a rationale for the emergence of the Selena fandom in the few months and years after her death. So he writes, taken by themselves, her songs are fairly stock romantic tunes. Something else was at work. That something was the Mexican female body. I had danced with such women, women perhaps not as attractive as Selena, but sometimes close enough. Women who dressed and made up their often equally voluptuous and morena bodies and faces in tight polyester fabrics of bold colors and with makeup that explored the limits of the word garish. Women who refashioned the best that Kmart and Target could offer, a refashioning at some considerable distance from Ann Taylor and L.L. Bean. So how does this quote sit with you compared to the one on the previous slide? So let's think about the phrase Mexican female body that, he, that the author is using. It seems as if the author expects to share with the reader a common understanding of what this body is, what it looks like. That certain image, would come, he's asking them right to bring it to mind. And then he adds some detail in that picture. It's voluptuous. She is pointing to one that is often frequent, that is often described as curvy, hourglass, pear-shaped, these are the bodies that have been associated with Latinas, right? He also falls back on a word in Spanish to convey Selena's skin tone, a word that has its own set of connotations in Spanish, especially when it is used like a nickname for someone. It reveals the colorism that exists in Latino communities. I also want to pay attention to the word garish as he describes what the fem Mexican female body wears. Because not only is he sexualizing and racializing Selena and other bodies like hers, but he is classing them as well, right? He's saying they're only wearing clothes from Target and, and Kmart versus the upscale brands of Ann Taylor and L.L. Bean. 
and I'll share that I had several students enrolled in the current semester remark how annoying it was for the author to point to, and I quote, boring L.L. Bean as a standard of beauty and status. But it's this dismissiveness of the worth and value of the female Mexican body seeps through his sense making about what Selena possibly has to offer. So let's move on to the border. Here, the author has written, Welcome to La Frontera, the painful wound dividing Mexico and the United States, a land of missed opportunities where outlandish dreams and workaday life intertwine. La Frontera is where English isn't spoken, but broken, and where I becomes ay carajo, a free zone, autonomous, and perceived by Anglo-Americans as a galaxy of rascuachismo. Since her tragic death, Selena has become omnipresent in La Frontera. So in this piece, to mark the place where Selena has made her mark, the author here writes to the border as a place of missed opportunities. And I ask the students to think about where is the responsibility for the inequities, the poverty, um, lies with this particular statement because it seems with this move the author is placing the onus on the population that lives there as not taking advantage of resources and accesses and, and access to, to different possibilities to improve their life that somehow these are these are um, opportunities they have not pursued and I asked my students who live um, in the areas we understand as the borderlands of Texas is if this is how they understand their communities, their families, their lives as not taking up the means to make their lives better and it doesn't usually ring true with them. The author also writes that English is broken here, ironically positioning English as the rightful language of this space, that it is what should be heard and spoken correctly. But if you have a critical understanding of the history of Texas, you would know that Spanish has been echoing, echoing along the borderlands for far longer. So why wouldn't the author have written where Spanish continues to be used and accessed by these populations in various fluencies? He also humorously writes that here I becomes I carajo in this space, relying almost on a cartoonish understanding of Spanish to minimize its use here. You can almost hear this in Speedy Gonzalez's voice, ay, ay, arriba, arriba. And this provides an opportunity for students to talk about the way Spanish is denigrated, the way it's mocked and shamed and experiences they have regarding either speaking Spanish or not speaking Spanish. In this passage, he also describes the border as free and autonomous, which really calls back to the ways Hollywood Westerns portray Mexico on the border as this lawless, immoral, criminal, dangerous space. And I ask students to think about the way that continues to be a prevailing image and discourse about the border, especially regarding the influx of immigrants that we've had of late that have made these spaces even more um, um, dangerous and uninhabitable. And if we always already think of the space in this way, what presuppositions then do we have about the people that are there? Lastly, he uses the word rascuachismo to describe its aesthetic and cultural taste. And while this term has been reclaimed by Chicano scholars as a way to validate being resourceful and creative um, and clever when decorating and beautifying, here there is that trace of elitism, um, again, relegating it to a low class, um, not high culture, not affluent um, kind of aesthetic choices and practices. So he's noting that these places are devoid, devoid of high culture and refinement. And so again, if this is where you put Selena and her cultural work, how are you going to understand and imagine the community that lives there? Once again, keep all this in mind as we look at the next quote about the border. The cumbia norteño has been absorbed into the Mesoamerican matrix the millenarian indigenous civilizational complex that exists beneath the veneer of colonization in what is today called Mexico and the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. The Norteño borderlands in Texas are a permeable changing entity reminiscent of the claim, Atlan is wherever I eat a taco. In this particular piece, it comes from uh, an article where the author is situating the musical style of Selena's most successful and popular hits as having both um, 
the cumbia as having both musical, geographical, and even epigenetic roots. She says that the cumbia that Selena sings belonged to a borderlands culture that existed for millennia and that still resonates with the indigenous cultural traditions of this land's native inhabitants. It describes this heritage as a complex civilization, which is different from the way native peoples are typically described as primitive, simple, savage. She also very subtly notes the imposition of the current Western American way of life as superficial or a thin excuse for civilization in contrast to um, what has pre-existed. And she pointedly remarks that the space has not always been carved into two halves, known as Mexico and the US. Mostly, she is pointing to this dynamic cultural production that circulates in this space, regardless of the lines drawn on a map. And she incorporates a quote, the quote, Atlan is wherever I eat a taco, is from a performance artist who is drawing on Chicano movement mythology, where um, using the concept Atlan as a name for the land pre-existing Spanish conquest. And that, that is a home space and, and ways of knowing exist within her and wherever she chooses to engage in these practices. And so all of this together in this brief passage point to the border as being rich and complex and in motion and ephemeral. And so I ask students again to think about how this resonates with their lives, how they understand this space, um, which are the predominant images of this space that get conveyed generation after generation, what that means about how they understand and where they might come from. And um, I, I mentioned earlier that um, I asked them to think about who these quotes were written, who these uh, pieces were written for, what audiences, or what um, connection to Selena the authors might have had in, in putting them together. Um, and so um, I hope you have your own um, guesses, right, about how you would answer that question in regard to the four quotes that I have already shared. Um, the next two um, quotes are about language and um, culture. And so these are a little bit more straightforward, um, and they're indicative of what the majority of scholars point to as a key factor in Selena's significance. Less of a comparison and contrast with each other as the previous slides have been, but I think still really um, imp important for um, one of the key aspects of the course and what this body of scholarship um, puts forth. So the first one is like other Tejanas and Tejanos several generations removed from Mexico, Selena's struggle with Spanish symbolized legacy of violent language oppression in Texas. Selena's negotiation with the Spanish language is, is an example of how language represents a contested terrain upon which Mexican Americans and Tejanos negotiate and reshape their relations to social, political, and cultural institutions. What I ask students to pay attention to is to note how the author places the onus on hostile forces happening outside of the control of the individual that are intended to wipe out the use of Spanish. It's characterized as a brutal process. Again, this shifts the responsibility from the individual or from the family unit not caring about um, preserving the use of Spanish, about being lazy or disrespecting the language or cultural ties to recognizing the forces that have been at work for generations to remove access to the Spanish language. I also think it's worth examining the use of the word negotiation with Spanish, which is different than acquisition of the language. So to think about Selena in a dynamic relationship with the Spanish language, one of push and pull, of loss and gain, of pride and shame, it's a more useful way to describe what it's like to reclaim Spanish for those who did not grow up speaking it. I think it also removes the expectation that the use of the language would be perfect. Selena messed up her Spanish all the time and messed up publicly and often laughed about it. So this is another way to account for how messy that process is. Um, I also help my students understand what is meant by the notion of contested terrain to signal that as a function of colonization, the struggle over language use is about power and maintaining power. So it's a, and it's a back and forth pool for this area that continues to have people that have such strong connections, on, regardless of the side of the border that they are on. So the last quote that I have to share with you depicts um, the way Selena um, conveys what it's like to be both Mexican and American. 
Selena fans continuously refer to her proud embrace of her culture and class origins. For Tejanos and Tejanos, she was proof that with dedication, a family's love, and lots of hard work, you can have your Mexican cake and still share in the American pie. And again, this is a pretty consistent thread throughout the course readings and scholarship on Selena. Her very public and proud embrace of her culture and class origins, how she remained humble and true to her roots, even when she found success and fame, how she conveyed what it was like to be both of these things, Mexican cake, American pie, at the same time, without choosing, sacrificing, or prioritizing one over the other. So for a community that had, has been invisible to the mainstream despite its steady growth in the decades that Selena began her career, and even more so since um, her career ended, this level of representation is frequently mentioned as a key factor in her continued significance because these experiences continue to be the same for these communities. And so um, this course material allow me to take a moment with my students um, to examine what other representations might be similar. You know, what else other than Selena do we have that depicts what this is like? Um, and it's rare when they can point to an example. So as I indicated, that was the last quote I had to share with you. I've reached the end of my prepared remarks, um, but I do hope that I've illustrated what studying Selena can reveal um, about ourselves, about how people understand who those communities are, and just given a sneak peek of what the course is like, um, at least um, when I'm, I'm teaching it. Um, so I appreciate your time and attention and open the floor for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aleman. Speaking of being rusty, you all, I completely forgot a couple things in the beginning. So this is our first in-person event in Laurie Auditorium for the semester. Woohoo! Um, I'm Courtney Balderas. I'm the director for student diversity and inclusion. And thank you so much for this amazing talk. I'm, I really hope that you all have some questions for her. Uh, this course is something that I was so excited about when it was first announced. And I'm still hoping to get to take it because it really is transformative work. As somebody who was 11 years old when Selena died, um, I became much more familiar with her work after her death. Um, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood and just all of who she was spoke to me at that very young age and helped me negotiate and navigate that really hard time um, in my life. And so my question, I'll, I'll offer the first question, is kind of in some of the work and or you know from your lived experience, what did that look like, that transition from those who were dedicated fans to, and I know you spoke about students who are now like second generation Selena fans, which in the lead up to this presentation, I had talked with some students who haven't seen the movie or were like, I'm not as familiar with her, which is shocking to me. Mm. But what is that, what has that kind of looked like? Um, or what can you share about that? Yeah, thank you for that question, um, Courtney. So I, I will reflect what information my students have gathered, because they're the ones that have gone out and done these interviews. The first cohort of, of students who took the class was about um, about 25 students. They each conducted three interviews, two of them which had to be someone who we identified as second generation. One was first generation, like myself. Um, and so based on their observations, based on what they analyzed, um, they found there was patterns of a lot of kind of mother and daughter passing along of knowledge about Selena or a love of Selena. Um, it m mostly um, originated there, but it was also larger family. Like I learned it from my family. Um, it was just what was in our family space, especially tied to celebration. So there wasn't a lot of like um, specific knowledge about um, the different aspects of her, her life, the records that she broke, um, how short her career was, um, you know, they know some um, elements of, the, of her death com based on what the movie depicts. Um, but when they think about her, they really are thinking about home and they're thinking about family in ways that I think, um, at least based on the scholarship that was written at the time, you know, within that first decade after her death, don't really talk to, or talk, speak to, right? So that's kind of a shift that, that I've noticed, um, again, based on 
what my students have, have gone out and gathered. Um, and it's also just weird to, I just played um, in class last week a video clip of a video that Selena did. It's about a 15 minute like educational video that she did um, about the, uh, about the, the different types of Tejano music, and she's like ex explaining it to students. It's really cute, um, and it's like it's like done through PBS or something. And so many of my students said, I've never heard her talk before. I've only heard her sing. And so they had no idea what she sounded like, and so they were struck by the fact that her English has kind of like a Texas twang. If you've ever heard like interviews with her, um, you know, she, she has that kind of a drawl that'll seep into her voice. So they were shocked by that because they only have ever heard her speaking in Spanish, singing in Spanish. Um, so that was, that's kind of an interesting that's uh, recently has come up. Um, do others have questions? You can either come down or I'll bring the mic to you. Hi, uh, let me see if I can piece this question together in my head. My name's Stephen Drake. Um, I'm a senior at Trinity. I'm the president of Pride on campus, our LGBTQ plus student organization. And I guess um, just from, I saw a couple of the articles that were posted in the screen grabs on the presentation. I was really curious to know more about the reception amongst queer Latinos, Latinos, Latines, Latinequis. Um, of Selena's work, um, and maybe to tie it back to the presentation, especially the reception of her body and what her physical representation meant for people, and perhaps especially um, Latinos, Latinas, Latines who found themselves on La Frontera in very in between sort of place. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, yeah, I did, I included that screenshot of that article thinking maybe someone will be paying attention and want to ask a question about that. Um, and that the work that I showed was by um, another a scholar who's written a significant amount about Selena, um, Deborah Vargas, who's also uh, San Antonio uh, born and raised. Um, and what those in the scholarship, what mostly what they have focused on is um, drag performers who, who, who dress as Selena for their performance. And so they um, they, some of them are, have had conversations, interviews with those um, performers, and so they're talking about um, like that Selena, for many of them, was the draw where they could feel comfortable presenting themselves in that way, right? That they took the fact that she was so comfortable with her body and being fully herself 100% of the time that they could do it as well. And so she's kind of like the vessel that allows them to do that. And, and it, there's, you know, just uh, some of the pieces cover um, the that not and that her appeal is beyond just the Latino community um, for the queer community. That she has, um, like, she hits all the notes that are appealing um, for that kind of performance and that kind of um, uh, way of express expressing themselves. And so, um, yeah, they're really. Um, fantastic pieces to read and to uh, incorporate into our um, conversation in the class. And, they're, and they are from performers both on the US side and Mexico side of the border. Mm -hmm. Do others have questions or reactions? Coming so Hi, uh, my name is Sol Rivas Lopez. Um, I am a junior. I'm originally from South America, so I don't know that much about Selena because um, even though her music transcends borders, it doesn't really get down there. But I'm always very, I was, I've always been super interested about how mystical her uh, personality and her image has become. And I thought it was very interested, interesting how you mentioned that she kind of means different things for like the first generation fans and for the second generation fans. And in one of the quotes, um, it said that f she's kind of like this representation of like both like the American dream and the Mexican dream because like she, she gets her Mexican cake and her American pie. And I was wondering how has that changed with the years? Because I think there's a lot of um, th that narrative has been contested in the past few years, mm -hmm. especially by people for my generation, who would be her second generation fans, mm -hmm. and people who never really saw her, you know, live, they only saw, know her after her death. So, do you think that interpretation of her changes for the younger generations, and how? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think that that, again, this is, you know, after one semester in of having the opportunity to teach it, just one kind of round of, of collecting data, but that seems to be a very consistent thread that hasn't changed. Um, the first group of students in the class, um, they themselves were, the majority of them, were self-proclaimed Selena fans, even, and I think only two out of the 25 um, were in, in my generation. So they were all, you know, post-95 Selena fans. And, um, but they all shared that same experience that they, she made it okay for them to, to butcher Spanish or feel okay about that, that she, that she made it okay for them to realize um, why they were, you know, at times conflicted for, for not being quite Mexican enough for some parts of their family, for being um, too Mexican for other parts of their family. Um, all sorts of those kinds of experiences came through, not only with the students in the class, but the people that they interviewed. That, um, that continues to be um, a really strong um, element about what her appeal is. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious to see if that will, will wane at all. I mean, I, I, I really, because the, the conditions that cause that, that, those messages to be sent about um, with assimilationist ideologies, with the continuous um, kind of influx of, of new immigrants coming into Mexican-American communities, I think those conditions are going to make that continue to be an important thread for the community because those, those experiences aren't going to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aleman. By the way, Dr. Aleman and I go way back to we a do. really awesome organization that is national. So it's an honor to have you here mm -hmm. and to be a part of our Latinx uh, Heritage Month. I'm wondering if you can uh, shed some light on the Afro-Latinidad that JLo represents in also playing the part of Selena in the film. I know that it was very controversial when she was first selected to play Selena because she's Afro-Latina, Puerto Rican, New Yorkian, right? So have you explored that in your class and, and uh, what, what are some of the thoughts and, and some of the conversations that, that come around that topic? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I did include one of the screenshots was, um, the title of that piece was Jennifer as Selena. Um, by Frances Aparicio, and that is what she kind of engages and unpacks in that article about the, um, the tensions and that um, initial kind of conflict and resistance to JLo being cast. And that's something that a lot of um, like my students last semester didn't know. We haven't come to that point in the semester yet, so I don't know if students are aware, but um, you know, there was some serious backlash about her being cast um, when the film was, being, was in production. Um, and that but that piece, um, she she talks about the ways that um, ultimately um, Jennifer was able to kind of embody, you know, enough of Selena's characteristics that won people over or showed what those commonalities are, and beyond just um, physical similarities, right, in the way their bodies were shaped, which is one of the things that at least the, the media and mainstream discourse kept pointing to. But again, it was those conditions of colonization um, that both um, Puerto Rican communities and Mexican American communities have experienced that um, allowed Jennifer to say things like, you know, we are the same, we, we have a lot of the same experiences, and to reiterate that, um, kind of justifying how she um, understood and, and um, made sense of, of Selena's actions and behaviors as she ultimately portrayed. Um, but another piece that we engaged, it wasn't one of the examples that I showed that does um, um, tease out a little bit more of the roots of Af Afro-Latinidad in Selena's performance is by um, Deborah Vargas. And she talks about um, the ways that black disco performers at the time that Selena would have engaged, so the ones that she borrowed from, that she covered in the disco medley, um, right, were specifically drawing from this um, African, African-American way of, of uh, or musical styles of dancing or performing, of dressing. And so she, she 
sheds a light on those roots to to um, broaden the 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 influences of the of the Selena that we see like distilled right all in her today and so it's a really nice way to um, she does a really good job of unpacking all of that of pointing to those histories of bring, bringing that into the conversation of understanding um, you know that as as unique and wonderful and one of a kind as she was she really was drawing from a lot of of people as um, influencing her um, that had those specific ties mm -hmm. Um, hey, thank you. Um, my name is Ana Yancy. I'm a senior here. My question is, have you seen the new show on Netflix? And what's your opinion about it um, in comparison to the movie or like just in general? Thank you so much for that question. Um, we actually, um, yes, I have seen it, to answer it directly. Um, it, premiered like the last week of, of class last semester, so I didn't get to incorporate it into the course, but we are um, this semester. Um, we haven't gotten to that yet, um, so I'm, I am curious to see how my students themselves um, understand it. Um, personally, for me, I can answer, I can answer your question speaking from, from that um, point. Um, I, I absolutely loved the series. Um, for me, again, knowing that m one of my scholar, like my, the main focus of my scholarly interest is mediated representations of Latino communities, of Chicano communities, I understood um, the series, even though it was called Selena the Series, was really about the Quintanilla family and this, fa this Mexican American family and how they collectively work towards this goal um, to achieve this level of success. And it was literally about putting food on the table for this family, right? The, the first half of the season, this is what it's revealing for us. And I thought that it was such a beautiful way of understanding what so many of our families continue to do collectively to provide for each other, right? There's still the, the idea that um, younger family members are contributing, right, to the overall household well-being. That still happens. That still happens in many households. Um, I, I appreciated that they were showing that it was a collective effort rather than an individualistic effort, which is, I think, something that doesn't come across as clearly in the movie, one of the differences between them, um, right? That it was just, just um, Selena didn't do what she did by herself. It, it, she happened because all of them happened. Um, but most importantly, I was just, the the there were scenes from the series that were that looked like South Texas that smelled like South Texas that felt like South Texas the South Texas of my childhood the South Texas of where I go home to visit my mother um, the South Texas where a majority of my cousins live um, and so it just was such a rare portrayal of a world that is so near and dear to me that I don't get to see on TV hardly ever, 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 ever. And so for me, because it provided that, it was just fantastic. Um, and one of the things that I noted, the weeks that it premiered and was in the top you know, two on Netflix for the first two weeks or whatever it was, you know, very um, successful um, premiere, was at the very same week that Selena was in the number one spot or number two spot, whatever it was, um, that another movie, it was, it's a movie called Peppermint um, that stars Jennifer Gardner, um, was also in the top spot. And in that particular movie, I don't, has anybody in here seen that movie or know which one I'm talking about? Um, it was released in theaters. Um, and so she portrays like this um, white suburban American mom whose daughter gets killed by, um, by gangbangers, by drug dealers, who happen to be Latinos, and so she goes on revenge against them. Like she acquires um, assassin skills and comes back and wipes them out. And so the depictions of, of Mexican Americans from California takes place in California, and that film are the ones that we normally see, right? Of criminals, of, of cholos, of 
of speaking broken English. Um, they even have like all these scenes with the image of, of Santa Muerte, like behind them, around them. So all these like really, you know, the most disgraceful images of, of Latinos in that film. And so it was just, it struck me, right, that both of those things were on Netflix at the same time, appealing to audiences globally, and both of them were being watched. I, I don't know if, if I could say it equal numbers, because Netflix doesn't release, right, what their audiences are, but the fact that they were reaching significant portions, um, it, it really disturbed me and made me all the more happy that at least there was a counterbalance to that image at the time that the Netflix series was released. Okay, we have time for one more question. If not, I have one. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I was interested to hear what maybe has come out of the course specifically about your quote where we're talking about language, right? And kind of like the interrogation of that language, especially because you spoke to things as very specific to Texas's history too. Um, that like my father went through where speaking Spanish was really like looked down upon and or not allowed in school. Uh, and so growing up, I spoke Spanish early on, but then my siblings, like my parents didn't want us to have accents because of what, the, because of the discrimination that could follow for that. And so like what has kind of come out from students throughout this course? Cause right, if we were four years ago, I would have thought per five years ago, we had moved past some of that. Um, but mm -hmm. we've seen in the last five years how there is still very much a lot of prevalent hate publicly for people speaking Spanish in spaces where people believe perhaps it shouldn't be, yeah. which is not the case. So if, I, if I'm understanding your, your question, you're saying like what, what recent student experiences might be in terms of receiving messages about the Spanish language and how they kind of engage. Um, I don't think there's been that much shift. Um, I think it's it continues to be um, looked down upon. I mean, they and um, you know we we in the past what uh, I guess since 2016 right have seen plenty of of viral videos of people being you know publicly um, attacked, assaulted um, for being in a public space and speaking Spanish. Um, so those are things that they are uh, are still part of how they understand. Um, how the language is, is viewed in the world. Um, and I have a pretty nice mix of students who are non-Spanish speakers, who are multi-generation US born, and uh, a good number of students who are um, either you know, the first generation um, in their family to either be born here or to be educated here, um, who speak um, accented English, who talk about the challenges that they had with um, speaking English with an accent, of learning English, of, of the ways that they had to learn why someone who had the same last name as them in a class wouldn't speak Spanish at all, right? Not understanding that um, history of this particular space. And, um, and so it's, it's made for really fruitful, productive conversations. And again, um, I'm kind of like in this really nice um, bubble in the class that I teach because it is Mexican American studies and so um, it, it's through the Mexican American Studies program, and so many of my students either come in primed from other classes or, or wanting to engage the material because they have like some sort of critical awareness. So it, it makes it, I guess, a little safer space to kind of share some of that pain and trauma and, and ask questions and um, unpack it a little bit uh, more fully than they may not be possible in other classes for them. Thank you so much yes, again, Doctora. We really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you all. Thank you.